Columbia University professor James Hansen, a pioneer in recognizing the reality of climate change, spent more than four decades at the NASA Goodard Institute for Space Studies. It was a far cry from Hansen's hometown in Denison, Iowa, where he was born into a farming family in 1941. The public education system was good, but at the time, Hansen was not particularly studious. When I graduated from high school, if you looked at my uh, card, book card from the library, you'll find that I checked out three books. <laughs> I did not, so I was behind when I went to college. I had to catch up. While Hansen was studying physics and math at the University of Iowa, Indonesia's Mount Agong erupted, spreading particles around the world. This led to a complete blackout of the lunar disk during an eclipse, an event that sparked Hansen's interest in atmospheric physics. Hansen had the good fortune of being noticed by one of the world's leading space scientists, Professor James Van Allen. I was very lucky to go to the University of Iowa where Professor James Van Allen, a famous physicist who discovered the radiation belts around the Earth. Um, and, and I was lucky that he noticed me because I was a very shy student. I sat in the back of the class. Guided by Allen, Hansen investigated the high surface temperatures of Venus. After joining NASA, he proposed sending a probe to Venus to gather atmospheric data. Upon showing that Venus is surrounded by a thick atmosphere composed mostly of carbon dioxide, Hansen decided to look more closely at his home planet. We have here a planet that is changing before our eyes. That makes it a more interesting planet than Venus, and also more important because people live on this planet. Hansen's wife recalls his commitment to his studies. He told me, I'm sorry, uh, I, I can't stop working uh, so hard. I still have to add all my weekends, and uh, you will have to wait with family projects because I have to spend all my time on the Earth Project now because this is where our institute is going. After turning his attention to Earth, Hansen became a leading scholar in multiple fields. He was a pioneer of developing three-dimensional climate change models and compiled temperature records from around the world. A researcher who worked with him for 12 years explained the value of Hansen's methods. Any model can calculate the global average. But the three, only the 3D models can tell you how the temperature varies, you know, over space. You know, so for instance, in you know, one continent versus the other, that sort of thing. At the time, other scientists also created climate change models, but Hansen's team had the advantage of calculating the increases in atmospheric particles. We were the first ones to put in the actual changes of the atmosphere and then calculate what is the effect of them. We actually let the CO2 and other gases increase as they were observed to increase and then continue into the future with some different scenarios. A powerful way of understanding the occurrence of climate change is to examine geological records from past climate change events. Hansen's first Earth Studies Research Laboratory at NASA used this method by studying sediment layered on the seafloor. The best information on the Earth's history, on the climate changes that have occurred in the past, actually comes from uh, the ocean cores. Because the floor of the ocean, the sediments uh, continually rain down onto the floor of the ocean and the sediments pile up but they contain a record of what the conditions were at the time that they uh, fell to the floor of the ocean. So we can reconstruct how climate changed over time. The results of Hansen's climate change model compared favorably to sediment core data. In 1981, Hansen published his first paper that clearly attributed a rise in global surface temperatures to CO2 emissions caused by human activities. Fearing that the greenhouse effect would continue unabated, he warned of major impacts, droughts in North America and Central Asia, the melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet, 
a rise in global sea levels and the opening of the Northwest Passage. This study is Hansen's most important achievement to date. It actually laid out the framework for the whole problem. Um, and uh, we calculated that, well, gee, if you actually burn all the fossil fuels, you'll make a different planet. Since then, we've just been filling in the details and, and confirming what we calculated in 1981. Obviously, it's important for humanity to figure out uh, what their energy sources are going to be and how much we can use fossil fuels. So we've just been refining those early estimates. Hansen's paper sparked discussion among academics and he gave congressional testimony several times, but the impact of his warnings was limited. During a particularly crushing heat wave in 1988, Hansen again sounded the alarm. Therefore, when I realized that it was a very hot summer and we had a big drought in the United States, so people would pay attention to climate. Then I knew, oh, this is the chance to say something. And so the hope was we would get attention. We got probably even more than <laughs> At a June 23, 1988 congressional hearing, Hansen declared it was 99% certain that human activity was a cause of global warming. This time, he captured people's attention. His proclamation made the front page of the New York Times. His work on uh, human-caused climate change especially has been a huge influence uh, uh, in the public uh, perception of climate change, I would say, and in the public debate about climate change. In the 1980s, the White House began to apply pressure to Hansen, even censoring his testimony. Some members of the scientific community were sharply critical of Hansen's blunt assessments to get the uh, flag from other scientists who said, well, you really shouldn't be talking so much, leave that to others, or just to publish your papers. He would just swallow hard, and he was Jim functioned very low on the emotional level, but um, I'm very emotional. I also have good insight. I can read expressions, I can see how he feels, and, and I notice when he doesn't sleep well, and, and all of that. Um, yes, made it really hard for me to, uh, to, be, to be part of his life at that time. In the 1990s, Hansen kept a relatively low public profile and instead focused on research. In 2001, when the White House invited him to brief senior officials on climate change, he thought the government was ready to act, but no policy changes followed. Hansen then became more vocal about global warming after Hansen escalated criticism of government leaders in 2006, the White House applied pressure and NASA tried to silence him. For the sake of his grandchildren, however, he refused to comply. I said my grandchildren. I didn't want my grandchildren to say that Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't make it clear. Initially limiting his appeals to speeches, Hansen gradually took a more hardline approach. When traveling to give a lecture at Virginia Tech, Hansen's students told a story about the environmental activist Larry Gibson. Gibson refused to sell a cabin in the coal mining area of Cayford Mountain to protest against coal companies blowing the tops off of mountains to get at the coal underneath. Mountaintop removal also leads to severe erosion, polluting rivers and water sources. This is crazy. Why? Just to get this fossil fuel, we're destroying the environment, and, and we have people like Larry Gibson who are standing up and actually facing danger. There were, uh, there were people who uh, shot bullets into his cabin. So anyway, I agreed to go to this protest um, about mountaintop removal, and uh, we got arrested. So that was my first arrest. Hansen continued to participate in environmental demonstrations. 
including a protest at the White House against petroleum pipeline expansion. He was arrested many times. As Hansen stepped up his activism, he continued to conduct research and publish papers. In 2008, he assembled a group of scientists that named 350 parts per million or 350 ppm as the maximum safe level of atmospheric CO2. Well, I was very um, pleased that I decided to ask some of the best relevant scientists in the world if they would um, work with me in developing a paper to try to estimate, well, what is the safe level? And we came up with the conclusion that at most, the safe level on the long run is 350 parts per million. The 2016 Paris Agreement called for holding the global average temperature increase to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which equates to a CO2 concentration of 450 parts per million. Many nations agreed to work toward keeping the temperature increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to Hansen's call for a 350 parts per million threshold. In 2009, Hansen published the book Storms of My Grandchildren. Former U.S. Vice President Al Gore called Hansen the scientist with the most powerful and consistent voice, calling for intelligent action to preserve our planet's environment. During a 2012 TED Talk titled, Why I Must Speak Out About Climate Change, Hansen warned that we must act quickly or we will leave humanity with a climate system spiraling out of control. Hansen's wife says her husband wasn't always comfortable making such a high-profile speech. It was hard for him because it's against his nature. He had to overcome a barrier in his psyche to speak out and I would sit and I would watch these talks and I would be hurting. I would really be hurting but doing it. He made up his mind to make the story as clear as can be and no one was going to stop him. In 2013, Hansen retired from Goddard which enabled him to take a more active role in advocating for limiting greenhouse gases at the Earth Institute, Columbia University, he founded the Program on Climate Science, Awareness and Solutions, which gathered scientists from various fields to discuss climate-related topics. Our goals are climate science, public awareness, and uh, solutions. You have to put together uh, these different, different branches of science. More than 30 years after Hansen's landmark testimony, his warnings have proven prescient. There is a feeling now that the best time to act has already passed. Atmospheric CO2 stands at about 408 parts per million, and Hansen predicts terrible consequences if it reaches 450 parts per million. You go, have to go back several million years to find 450 ppm. And when you do, you find that it was a different planet. The shorelines were very different. Uh, sea level was 15 to 25 meters higher. Well, that would eliminate a large, it would eliminate Florida and the United States and a significant part of China. For Hansen, the single most effective way to reduce emissions would be a carbon fee or tax on polluting companies. The most important thing is making the price of fossil fuels honest. It needs to include its cost to society, the effect of air pollution and water pollution on human health, and the effect on climate. Since mankind has waited too long to act, Hansen also believes that we must extract CO2 from the atmosphere. It will require extracting some CO2 from the atmosphere as well as reducing emissions rapidly, but that's still um, realistic to, to hope that you could do that. While Hansen thinks we still have time, dithering by government agencies led him to go on the offensive. About 10 years ago, he launched a Litigate to Mitigate campaign. During this period, Hansen's granddaughter Sophie grew up in 2015, a group of youths launched a 2015 lawsuit against the U.S. federal government in an effort to protect their future. 
among the plaintiffs is Sophie. So groundbreaking is um, our, our ties to the Constitution, connecting climate change in the Constitution. So we argue young people's rights to life, liberty, and property, Fifth Amendment rights, due process, the just equal protection under the law as adults. There's a lot that we have going for us that no one's really brought into a courtroom before. But if the other branches of government aren't acting appropriately on an issue, it is the court's job to step in. Uh, and intervene. So, I mean, our case is incredibly strong. Hansen serves as the lead scientific advisor for his group of 21 youths. He is a strong promoter of the case, which he calls enormously important. I think it's the equivalent of the civil rights suit in 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education. It will finally force the government to do its job and protect the rights of young people. And we're running out of time, so I, I think we'd better win it pretty soon. Sophie has always deeply respected her grandfather. When together, they rarely discuss issues like global warming, but they are both optimistic about the case. I think that if there is any time for climate change to be solved, it's definitely now with this new generation of young people who are so excited by science and so, so connected with each other through technology and social media. Youths tend to show great passion for global warming issues, so Hansen is writing a new science education book called Sophie's Planet to offer them a better scientific grounding. They need to look at all the alternatives. It's a question of um, energy policies and understanding the impacts of different energies on climate and on human health. And you need to look at these objectively and um, assess the pros and cons of the different uh, possibilities. The book's opening includes an emotional letter to young people. Hansen worries that he did not do enough to clearly communicate the risks we face, but his wife strongly disagrees. You, you don't have any blame here. You only have credits. And don't blame yourself because you have tried and you have tried as hard as anyone, harder than anyone, harder than anyone. And you have not failed. Others have failed. You won. But the story is not over. Several years ago, Hansen promised his wife that he would build a stone wall in front of their house, but he didn't get far. She never pushed him and instead did the work herself. She knows that Hansen has a far more important mission in life. Their life and then their children's lives are going to be dependent on um, the world doing the right thing. Widar Bhattaran Ramanathan, a professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego, is a leading climate change scientist. He was born in Chennai, the Indian city of Madurai, which is closely associated with Tamil, one of the longest surviving classical languages in the world. As a youth, he was happiest playing on his grandfather's farm. My fondest memories of my time in India is when I spent the summers in a remote uh, town where my grandfather's farm was. When Ramanathan was 12, due to his father's work, his family moved to Bangalore. Classes at his new school were taught entirely in English, a language that Ramanathan did not understand. As his grades dropped, he learned a very valuable lesson. I couldn't understand what they were saying, so I had to learn everything by myself. I'll go home and do in my mind, thought experiments. 
about chemistry, physics, yet put me in that mode, not listening to others, figure everything out for myself. After graduating with a degree in engineering, Ramanathan worked for a coolant manufacturer, but found that job did not suit him. In 1970, he went to the United States in search of a better lifestyle. My main reason for coming to America is to enjoy the good life. I think it was basically my fascination with big American cars. I got fixated was this Chevy Impala. Unexpectedly, the professor whom Ramanathan followed to the U.S. switched from specializing in engineering to atmospheric sciences. My professor changed his field from engineering to studying uh, atmospheres of Mars and Venus. It's a totally new field for him and for me. But again, the traumatic experience in the high school helped me out. Ramanathan began a postdoctoral research position at NASA's Langley Research Center. Thinking back to the coolant factory where he worked, he remembered frequent CFC leaks. Further studies showed this common coolant was a potent greenhouse gas. I was shocked to find that just one molecule of the CFC 11 and 12 has more warming effect, more potent, about several thousand times more potent than carbon dioxide. As an unknown scholar, Ramanathan did not feel his climate science research would be well received. Unexpectedly, he had a paper on the greenhouse effect of CFCs published in the journal Science. The shocking thing for me, the paper got accepted, and uh, next day, it was on the front page of New York Times and it talked about it, the climate effects. And then I knew I'd never be able to buy my Chevy Impala. Around the same time, Ramanathan married an Indian woman introduced to him by his family. After immigrating to the U.S., she took an interest in his work. When he comes home, we would go out to the NASA park, go around for a walk, and he was so excited because his paper was going to come out that day. And uh, I think I even have a picture of the NASA part. I think it brought us close, you know, that the fact that he talked to me so much about his research and got me involved in every aspect of it. Ramanathan's discovery of the dangers of CFCs made in 1975 was groundbreaking. Earlier research in the field concentrated on CO2. From 1895 to 1975, people thought carbon dioxide is the only greenhouse gas we need to worry about. So this my study on CFCs opened the door to a host of other pollutants. Worldwide restrictions on the use of hydrocarbons followed, particularly through agreements made in the Montreal Protocol of 1987. After showing how CFCs are greenhouse gases, Ramanathan began to think about when we would see the Earth warm. In 1980, he joined peers in publishing a paper on the topic. If this theory is right, the warming would show up before year 2000. And uh, unfortunately, that prediction came to be true. It was in 2001 a team of thousand scientists concluded the warming is here. Ramanathan then sought to launch climate satellite equipment with radiation meters. He became interested in clouds. Clouds have both cooling and greenhouse effects, and he wanted to know which was stronger. So it turned out uh, the major effect of clouds is cooling the planet, okay? So then you ask, how is that connected with climate change? If the planet warms and evaporates the cooling clouds, there will be a significant amplification feedback of it. After studying cloud formation, Ramanathan's research 
took a new direction. Again, it's a vast field. I had not done any work on this. But again, I go back to that high school trauma. I have just no fear in my mind of going into any field which needs to be done. Ramanathan's wife understood the challenges he faced. But at that time, very little was known about clouds. Very little was known about the interaction between radiation and clouds. So Ram had had an uphill battle, you know, when he started in the field. Uh, radiation was not known at all, and it was given the least amount of importance. When conducting sky observations, he noticed that the amount of sunlight shining over the ocean was much lower than models predicted. To determine whether gaseous substances in the atmosphere were to blame, in the 1990s, he led a large-scale field survey called the Indian Ocean Experiment, or INDOEX. So I had the suspicion it's because something is trapping the sunlight. So to figure that out, we decided to go to the most polluted uh, ocean, which is uh, the Arabian Sea. A multinational project led by Ramanathan began. Mark Themans, a professor at UC San Diego, who had worked with Ramanathan, described the effort. But it coordinated seven or eight universities, or countries, plus the universities in it. Probably um, two or three satellites, ships, airplanes, balloons, ground-based. And it was a massive experiment. And just to coordinate something like that, we don't grow up learning how to do those. And uh, Ron pretty much was the lead in the whole thing. In his own quiet way, he was able to organize it, and it ran well. Everyone got a lot of science out of it, and we learned a lot. The project discovered a stream of brownish, dirty air above Southeast Asia. We discovered massive brownish plumes covering the ocean. I found the thing which was cutting sunlight going into the ground, which was black carbon soot. And while models had talked about black carbon effect in terms of warming, no one had predicted this massive, it became called global dimming, dimming of the sunlight. Ramanathan developed unmanned aircraft platforms to better track down brown clouds pollution. By taking both vertical and horizontal measurements, these devices conducted three-dimensional analysis of cloud layers. At this point in his life, Ramanathan had established himself as a leading climate change scientist. Before age 60, he saw global warming primarily as a scientific question, but he would soon adopt a new outlook. I still remember, every time I have a major paper come out, I'll take my wife and family to celebrate. I now realize I should have cried every time I publish my paper, because I now look back and think of them as basically obituaries. What led to this change? In January 2007, the new UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon invited Ramanathan to speak to a group of high school students about global warming. After the speech, an African girl asked a troubling question. You made us cry with your talk, but tell me what you are doing to save us. I looked at her, didn't have anything to say. Before this wake-up call, Ramanathan had already begun to make changes. After finding the Asian brown cloud, he returned to the Indian Ocean to gather more data. In a way, he was returning to his roots. He learned how everything is connected. And I started seeing how it's linked with these poor women cooking with cook stoves, and I started talking to the community and they showed me how many billion women die and children. You know, they hold their kid in their hip and cooking, right? So that had a huge impact on me. Ramanathan began to consider the social injustice that climate change has brought. In 2007, he founded Project Surya, which encourages the poor to use cleaner forms of energy when cooking. He further cemented his position as an advocate of environmental change through his work with the Vatican. 
In 2004, Pope John Paul II asked Ramanathan to join the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Each year after Ramanathan joined Academy meetings, he contributed to a 2011 Pontifical report on the fate of mountain glaciers that ends with a statement, we must protect the habitat that sustains us. So that was it for me. And I see that's when I realized it's our responsibility and my responsibility. Following Pope Francis' inauguration, the Vatican pushed the rights of the poor to the top of the church's agenda. In 2014, during a two-minute report to the Pope, Ramanathan convinced Francis of global warming's impact on the poor by making the following statement. 60% of the pollution is coming from the richest one billion people. There are poorest three billion. They are everywhere in the planet and they have not even discovered fossil fuels. They are going to suffer the worst consequences. After hearing what he had to say, Francis asked what could be done in response. I told him, uh, look, uh, you have become the moral leader of the world. People would listen to you. So please ask people to be good stewards of the planet. And we cannot uh, continue like this. That was it. Six months later, the Pope spoke about the importance of curbing global warming. It is not easy for scientists to speak about topics like climate change with religious leaders. Oceanographer Walter Monk, who is known as the Einstein of the Oceans, joined his friend Ramanathan at a 2014 science conference at the Vatican. I'm not sure that I'm the most effective person to talk to church people. I'm too unchurchlike, but I do respect him for his efforts. Monk studies sea level changes. Early in his career, he helped predict surf conditions during the Normandy invasion. My interests go way back to sea level. When I first came to Scripps, sea level was rising very slowly, five millimeters a century. I, it's not much. And it's gone up to 30 millimeters and more a century. And there's a real problem of how the present civilization will survive under those circumstances. And Ram has devoted his last years of life to trying to make that possible. Ramanathan's love of science was passed on to his children. He has two daughters and one son. The son is a neuroscience researcher at UC San Diego. Earlier on, it was his passion for science, you know, and it was something that he would be so excited about the discoveries he would make. And it was something that as a kid, I wouldn't understand necessarily, but he would always, he would always, even as a young age, try to explain what he did and make it interesting and make science so interesting. And what he did so interesting that it was kind of natural for me to grow up and think, oh, I want to be a scientist like my dad. Ramanathan's daughter-in-law works near her husband. Due to Ramanathan's influence, they heed the mental health impact of global warming. So many societies that are getting displaced now and, and there are wildfires in California, there are floods around the world. How can we be better prepared to um, deal with the mental health of the future, which will be so closely impacted by the climate changes that are gonna come? Family discussions often resemble global warming brainstorming sessions. Ramanathan's two daughters live in Los Angeles. As a part of Project Sura, they encourage Indian women to use solar stoves for cooking. The elder daughter established a nonprofit organization that uses technology to measure the usage of solar powered cook stove technologies. The younger daughter goes into the field to collect data. When it comes to science, they say their father is highly demanding. He is a difficult man to work with. <laughs> um, I think we just continue to be amazed, even 
through those difficult interactions, I'm now at a point, having worked with my father now for 10 years, I'm now at a point where even when I'm in that moment, I no longer feel upset because I know I have the 100% faith that it's going to take us to something amazing that nobody else could have gotten to. How do you really get to truth of science? I think you really have to be detail oriented and you have to be willing to ask hard questions. And so I think that's really what it's been like to work with him is that he asks really hard questions and when I'm ready to have a project be done, he usually asks a really hard question that adds a lot more time to my plate. More than anything, Ramanathan enjoys playing with his grandchildren. See, look, it's 30 and 30. Okay, let's give a high five to the tank champion. Their favorite game is darts. During play sessions that sometimes last for hours, Ramanathan finds creative ways to incorporate global warming lessons. Tell me what you learned from the plastic project you did with me. I learned that plastic is in too much. It's in everything, even us, and that apparently around 90% of all seabirds have eaten plastic before. You, you did a small essay for me on how everything in this world is connected. Some of the freshwater lakes go into, um, into the, lead into the ocean. It creates a big storm, and when it, when it rains, so plants need carbon dioxide to make oxygen. Right. And then we breathe it in and we give the and we breathe out carbon dioxide for the plants to make more oxygen. Ramanathan's son in law is proud of what his children have learned. Stuff that you've been teaching them. I don't know for some reason it's stuck now, so we're all trying to reduce our plastic. Good to hear. Ramanathan's wife calls her husband a romantic at heart. I'm always surprised that he remembers, <laughs> you know, my birthday and our anniversary. He always wishes me in the morning, doesn't forget. And he always has a card and he writes nice things there. He's also very romantic. Nobody would know that except me. <laughs> when with family, Ramanathan can take a break from the troubling problems he confronts at work. He loves holding his youngest granddaughter. At less than one year old, she has her whole life ahead of her but Ramanathan worries about her future. We are sending, in my case, my grandchildren, and younger, like you, sending your children on that plane, which has a 5% chance of falling down, right? None of us will get on that plane. Nevertheless, Ramanathan remains optimistic. I get, at times, completely sense of uh, despair when I see this, but I feel I'm giving a bad message. I have to combine that with the solutions, the hope and the expectations for the young people. The change has to come from the bottom. James Hansen and Wirabhadran Ramanathan were joint winners of the 2018 Tang Prize in Sustainable Development. In the eyes of these two leading climate change scientists, the award has different meanings. For Hansen, the monetary award that comes with the Tang Prize arrived at just the right time. At Columbia's Earth Institute, funding for Hansen's research comes from donations. Even with Hansen's fame in the field, money is hard to come by. It's hard, uh, partly because I say positive things about nuclear power and most, a lot of uh, people don't like that. But I have to uh, say what the science indicates. The Tong Prize gives Hansen a chance to focus on writing his education book without having to worry about funding sources. I want to get that finished within the next few months. You know, with, um, by the beginning of next year. Um, and that's actually why, you know, I've said one of the good things about the Tang Prize is it allows me to focus on that because it helps support my group for a few more months while, so I don't have to go out looking for support for them. At the end of September, Hansen traveled to Taiwan with his wife to accept the Tang Prize. 
In his acceptance speech, he indicated the importance of youth science education and urged government leaders to take greater responsibility. I am writing Sophie's Planet to and for young people. I will do my best to make it useful to them. Ultimately, all of us are dependent upon the actions of our political leaders. However, it is crucial to evaluate objectively what our leaders are doing. Trust but verify. Promises are not enough. Born in the Midwestern U.S., Hansen bravely faces down critics. Like a lightning rod, he absorbs rumors and criticism in defense of the truth. No matter the method of attack used against him, he is still willing to take on authority. I guess my mother was very stubborn, and she uh, was very persistent in bringing up uh, seven children. Uh, so I think I get my stubbornness from her. Born in India, Ramanathan provides suggestions to government officials in the U.S. and has the ear of California Governor Jerry Brown. Ramanathan developed a project named Bending the Curve Climate Change Solutions, which gathered a group of 50 academics and researchers from across the University of California school system to outline scalable solutions for carbon neutrality and climate stability. I, I'm leading a course called Climate Solutions Course. It's a hybrid course. We had the top experts tape the lectures, the solution to the problem, all angles, societal transformation, governance, market instruments, technology, land management. And we launched it in all 10 campuses. So now we are expanding that course to state university, and then we want to take it to the rest of the nation. Ramanathan was deeply moved at being named a Tong Prize Laureate. I have received, uh, you know, many uh, recognitions, but this the first from Asia. It just made me something inner happiness because that's the continent I was born in. I'm going to use this recognition to take the cause and take the solutions to Asian countries, China. India, Bangladesh, right? Because I would say I am a Tang laureate. It'll open the doors for me. His family, including his children and grandchildren, joined him in Taipei for the award ceremony. During his speech, Ramanathan mentioned a planned cooperative effort with National Taiwan University. I am extremely happy to tell you I had discussions with top leaders from National Taiwan University and there's going to be a joint collaboration with the NTU and University of California system to take this to course to young people uh, in uh, Taiwan. Ramanathan believes that individuals have the power to change the world. If you go back in history, it's one person and people who made the change, not governments, not leaders, right? I mean, I go from my own person in the India, Gandhi, one person, and his troop of poor and beggars drew out the mighty British Empire. So we need to have hope. Ramanathan devotes himself to integrating science, policy, healthcare, and religion together toward common goals, pushing aside his own beliefs to work with those with different religions or political views. I basically now give lectures in churches and I went to uh, the red state, Omaha, Nebraska, in the middle of winter. 700 people showed up. So there is hope. The solution has to come from bottom up. We cannot just wait for the leaders. They need our support. Then they will do it. A 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report stated that continuing on our current path would lead to global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2040. Catastrophic consequences could occur if we exceed this level. The report underscores the importance of the work carried out by Hansen and Ramanathan.
Despite having very different styles, these two renowned scientists are working toward the same goal. They hope to leave a sustainable Earth for future generations to call home.